Now, let's discuss the first stage of labor. So in review of all of our stages of labor, let's remember that stage one starts from onset of labor until 10 centimeters dilated. Stage two is 10 centimeters dilated until the delivery of the infant. And stage three starts with delivery of the infant and ends with delivery of the placenta. So in stage one, we have contractions that are causing cervical change, and they're also causing the fetus to descend into the pelvis. We can further divide stage one into latent labor, which is onset of contractions until four centimeters dilated, and into the active phase. This is from six centimeters dilated to 10 centimeters dilated. Now we have some parameters that we consider to be normal for the first stage of labor. For a premiparous woman in latent labor, we expect that to last under 20 hours. For a multiparous, we expected it to last under 14 hours. In the active phase, we expect the cervix to change 1.2 centimeters per hour for our first-time moms and 1.5 centimeters per hour for our multiparous moms. So when we have an abnormal first stage labor, what causes that? Well, we think of the three Ps, power, passenger, and pelvis. With power, we're talking about the strength of the contractions. Now, how do we measure the strength of the contractions? Typically in labor, our moms are gonna have a monitor on that tells us from externally how often they are contracting. If we wanna know how strong the contractions are, we place an intrauterine pressure catheter that measures something called the Montevideo units. The Montevideo units are a measurement that have taken over a 10 minute strip looking at all of the contractions and, mary, me, and measuring the area under the curve. We expect it to be 180 to 220 Montevideo units to say the contractions are adequate. If those contractions are not adequate, we're going to start a medication called Pitocin. This is a synthetic form of oxytocin and this makes the contraction stronger. Now our next P is passenger. So what can go wrong with our passenger, passenger to make the first stage of labor abnormal? Well, we could have malpresentation of our passenger, such as a breech presentation, a face presentation, or a brow presentation that would prevent the passenger from coming down the pelvis, or the passenger could be having fetal heart rate issues. Now our next P is the pelvis. Now there's no way to determine what type of pelvis a patient has prior to labor, but just of note, there are four different types of pelvises. And depending on the type of pelvis, that can ease the delivery or it can make the delivery more difficult. So the gynecoid pelvis is one that allows the head to always rotate to occiput anterior, making vaginal delivery pretty easy. Anthropoid pelvis, more common in African-American women, cause the fetal head to rotate to the occiput posterior position. While they can still have a vaginal delivery, sometimes that can be a little difficult, and sometimes it requires an operative vaginal delivery to get those last little maneuvers to have the fetal head go underneath the pubic symphysis. The platypoloid pelvis will cause the fetal head to be in a transverse position. If you remember from our previous lecture, we need that fetal head to be occiput anterior or occiput posterior so that only nine and a half centimeters of the fetal vertex is trying to pass through the pelvis. Remember that the fetal pelvis is largest at 10 centimeters at its largest point. A transverse presentation is not going to be able to be passed through the pelvis. And an android pelvis is more like a guy's pelvis in that it's heart-shaped. And in this type of presentation, the fetal head has difficulty even engaging. Now, let's discuss the interpretation of fetal heart rate tracings. So let's go over some terminology and some nomenclature. When we talk about the fetal heart rate tracing, we talk about the baseline, the variability, and accelerations. When we talk about contractions, the bottom part of this example, we discuss if the contractions are normal and what tachycystole means. Let's start with baseline. So a normal baseline is between 110 beats to 160 beats per minute, and this is for the fetal heart rate. Tachycardia is considered to be 160 beats per minute sustained for a 10 minute time frame. And bradycardia is considered to be less than 100 beats per minute when it's sustained for a 10 minute time frame. So variability talks about the ability of the fetal heart rate to change above or below baseline. 
When the variability is absent, that means there's no change in the baseline. When it's minimal, it means it's less than 5 beats per minute. Moderate is 6 to 25 beats per minute. And market is greater than 25 beats per minute. In our example here, we would call this moderate variability. Now, when we discuss accelerations, we divide that to before 32 weeks gestation and after 32 weeks gestation. After 32 weeks gestation, we expect to see an increase in the fetal heart rate by 15 beats per minute for 15 seconds over a two minute tracing. Before 32 weeks, normal accelerations consist of an increase in the fetal heart rate by 10 beats per minute for 10 seconds over a two minute tracing. Now, contractions. A normal amount of contractions are five or less contractions in a 10 minute time frame. Uterine tachycystole means greater than five contractions in 10 minutes. Now, there's something called Montevideo units. When a, normally a patient is monitored in labor, they have an external fetal monitor on. Because it sits on top of the abdomen, it only tells us how often a patient is contracting. It doesn't tell us how strong those contractions are. With an intrauterine pressure catheter, we're able to determine the strength of the contractions. Now, how do we do this? We take a 10 minute strip or a 10 minute tracing. We look at the contractions during that time and we measure the area under the curve. Now, a normal amount of contraction or strength of contraction would be between 180 to 220 Montevideo units. That's considered to be adequate contractions to allow labor to progress. Now that we've talked about the, the fetal heart rate tracing and some of the terminology, let's talk about the nomenclature. So why do we even look at fetal heart rate tracing? Well, fetal heart rate tracing provides some information to us to tell us about the current acid-base status of the fetus. Now, we have three categories. Category one, which is normal. Category two, which can be indeterminate. And category three, which we consider abnormal. Let's see what makes each of those categories. So a category one tracing. In order for a tracing to be considered category one, such as this one, the fetal heart rate has to be between 110 to 160 beats per minute. There must be moderate variability, and there are no late or variable decelerations. Now, a category two tracing. Again, this is indeterminate to determine the acid-base status of our fetus. So the fetal heart rate can be between 110 to 160 beats per minute, but it can also be less than 100 beats per minute, which remember that means bradycardia, but variability must be present. It can be greater than 160 beats per minute, which again, that means tachycardia, but again, variability must be present. As far as the variability, it can be minimal or moderate, or if it is absent, such in this case, there can be no late or variable decelerations for it to be considered a category two tracing. Acceleration should be present. And if there are decelerations, which again, those can be late or variable, they can be present if there is minimal or moderate variability present. Now, category three tracing. This is considered abnormal, and this would mean that the acid-based fetal status is, a, is abnormal. So, category three, what makes a category three tracing? As far as variability, it is absent with late or variable decelerations, such as in this tracing. There can be bradycardia, which again is less than 100 beats per minute or something called a sinusoidal pattern. You'll also see this called a seesaw pattern and that actually shows fetal anemia. Now, let's talk about the different types of decelerations that we can see on a fetal heart rate tracing. We have early decelerations. These decelerations particularly mirror the contractions and these are physiologic. They're due to, the, to head compression and due to stimulation of the vagus nerve. Because they are physiologic, there's nothing that we need to do about them. Variable decelerations, you can see there's a sharp decline in the fetal heart rate, and then there's a sharp incline back to the baseline. Variable decelerations are due to cord compression. 
Now, they can be relieved by doing an amnio infusion, which is placing fluid inside the uterus through the intrauterine pressure catheter. That allows the fetus to get off of the cord and to relieve these variable decelerations. Now, late decelerations are a little bit more ominous. These are due to uteroplacental insufficiency. These we do have to address and we do want to correct. So how do we address them? One, we give oxygen to the mom so there's more oxygen going to the fetus. Two, if we are given Pitocin to make contractions happen, we want to stop the Pitocin. Three, we want to give IV fluids because that will allow more fluid to go to the placenta. And then four, we want to commonly place the patient in left lateral decubitus. So that means we roll the mom to the left side that will rotate the uterus off of the inferior vena cava so we have increased venous return to the placenta. Now let's take a case. You are called to the bedside of a 23-year-old Gravita 1 Para 0 female who is admitted in active labor. On her most recent cervical exam, she was 5, 90, and minus 1. She received an epidural approximately 10 minutes ago. Her fetal heart tracing, which was category one, is now shown to be this. How would you describe this tracing? What nomenclature would you use? Now, would you say that A, the patient is having early decelerations, most likely from rapid cervical change? B, patient is having variable decelerations, most likely from rapid cervical change? C, patient is having late decelerations, most likely from hypotension related to recent epidural placement, or D, patient demonstrates a category one fetal heart tracing. The answer is C. We would describe this fetal heart rate tracing as a category three. We can see that the patient is having a large late deceleration. Now, it's important to remember that when the epidural is placed, a lot of times moms will suffer from hypotension. This causes uteroplacental insufficiency, and the fetus will compensate by having late decelerations. Now, let's discuss obstetric anesthesia. So we have a lot of options for managing pain in labor. Let's take time to talk about each of these. First is inhaled analgesia. So this is in the form of nitrous oxide, also known as laughing gas. It's inhaled intermittently in labor. Mom is in control of that. Pain relief, however, is minimal and is short lasting. The side effects are nausea, dizziness, and lightheadedness. Nitrous oxide can be used for labor, but not for cesarean sections. Now, let's talk about systemic opioid analgesia. So basically, narcotics are given intravenously. We have to be careful though, because they are given intravenously, that means they go to the placenta and they can affect the fetus. Pain relief is minimal and short lasting, and they should not be given within four hours prior to expect it to, to delivery. Again, because it's intravenous, it goes to the placenta and the fetus can get the effects of the narcotic. Maternal side effects are nausea, vomiting, and drowsiness. Fetal or neonatal side effects are fetal heart rate abnormalities or respiratory depression. Now, let's talk about local opioid analgesia. So this would be in the form of a pudendal nerve block, as demonstrated here. It can be used for operative vaginal delivery or repair of lacerations or episiotomy. So it's not typically used during the labor process and it cannot be used for cesarean sections as it would not provide analgesia to the area needed, but it can be used when you're doing an operative vaginal delivery. It provides great pain relief along the nerve distribution. Now you have to be cautious when you're doing a pudendal nerve block because you can have potential hemorrhage if the pudendal artery is accessed instead of the nerve. Now, let's talk about regional opioid analgesia. So this is in the form of an epidural or spinal. So epidural anesthesia, typically used for labor, but can be used for C-section. During epidural placement, a catheter is placed in the epidural space to inject medication. It gives great pain relief from T8 to below, but it can be spotty. 
That means that patients can have what they call hot spots where they don't feel the, re the pain relief in that area. Now, the maternal side effect of an epidural is hypotension. This is particularly important, especially for laboring patients. With that hypotension, patients can experience uteroplacental insufficiency, and that can affect the fetus. And the fetus will manifest having that hypotension by, by having late decelerations. So spinal anesthesia. This is injected into the spinal fluid and it's used for C-sections. It gives great pain relief from T10 to below, so a little bit higher than our epidural, and it lasts for about two to four hours. Again, the maternal side effect is hypotension and bradycardia. And with that, again, the fetus can start to have late decelerations as a manifestation of uteroplacental insufficiency. Now, let's talk about general anesthesia. So general anesthesia is reserved only for emergency C-sections. Typically with C-sections, again, we use an epidural or we use spinal anesthesia. And even in some emergent cases, we can still use epidural or spinal. However, if it is an extreme emergency situation, we would need to do a C-section. Now, the reason that we reserve the general anesthesia for emergencies are because of the maternal side effects. A lot of times, moms can have vomiting, and that can result in aspiration pneumonitis, especially if mom has any food in her stomach or has not been in PO for eight hours. Fetal side effects of general anesthesia, respiratory depression.